Um, I'm G. Also known as uh, G to the next level. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, actually, probably would be better if I do this. So you see this. Um, but yeah, so a little bit about me. Um, I am a content creator of all sets of varieties. I do YouTube. I do Twitch. I'm an aspiring author. I'm now doing uh, more things on like through TikTok and a couple of the collaborations that I'm doing as well. Um, but mainly, my whole channel is roughly about. Retro gaming with a bit of Sega flair, but a bit of your own sort of uniqueness to it. So if you notice, like, G to the next level, because I'm more of a, of a Sega person than anything, but not limited to Sega. Like, I do all things retro when it comes to Sega, PlayStation, Nintendo, Neo Geo, Turbo Graphics, even stuff like Fairchild Channel F Atari. Like, I can, basically, I can basically cover really anything, because I'm sure, like, for nearly anybody who's come to this convention and whatnot, at least, like, retro has at least touched your heart and touched your life in some sort of variety, right? And that's basically how I'm able to, or what I wish to do through my YouTube channel, my Twitch stream, and, uh, and everything else. So, uh, so what we're going to do is um, I'm going to explain just a little bit about the channel, just real quick, super quick, like longer introduction on basically what I do. Um, I'll show you just like a little tiny bit of a trailer. And also, you all here at Portland Retro, you are going to get a sneak peek, exclusive sneak peek and an upcoming YouTube video that I've actually got in the works. So, uh, one I've actually been working on for quite a bit, so you're gonna see a little tiny snippet of it. And then uh, we're gonna talk about uh, retro gaming on Twitch, a little bit of that, and then we'll have some Q&A, and uh, if we have a little bit of time, which we should, uh, maybe even a little bit of a giveaway, because I got some prizes here too, so. How's that sound? Woo! Awesome, awesome. All right, so, yeah, just a little bit of introduction about me. Here we go. There we go. Actually, I don't need audio for this one. Um, so basically, this is, this is a, just a little snippet of who I am. And I've been doing YouTube for roughly about five years. I started off on another channel called iRetroGamer, which is now known as My Retro Life. Um, he brought me onto his channel as just sort of a co-host, just to randomly talk about Ghostbusters 2 on the NES. And because I was just trying to figure out, like, because I've always wanted to do something like YouTube for so, for so long, but I just kind of was spinning my wheels. I couldn't really tell exactly, like, what I wanted to do, how I wanted to present myself. Like, what's your gimmick? What's your catch? And that's generally the thing that I think about when anybody does content creation. It's like, I think anybody should definitely try it if you want to. But it's like, what's really the thing that makes you unique? And for me, it's basically about Sega, because even though I started with Atari and with the Nintendo and whatnot, my gaming life really started at the Sega Genesis. I even competed in the 94 Blockbuster World Championship, if you saw that. I didn't make it past the semifinals, <laughs> but, uh, but I did compete, and it was, it was pretty awesome. But um, I do all kinds of different things on YouTube, and I've been doing it now for about five years. Uh, I've been doing Twitch for roughly about a year and a half. And, um, and basically, we'll talk a little bit about like you know why I chose Twitch over YouTube when it comes to uh, to streaming and whatnot. But as you can see right there, I'm a huge fan of Sonic the Hedgehog as well. That little blue hedgehog essentially changed my life back in '91 and ever since. And who's excited for Sonic Frontiers? Huh? Are you excited for Frontiers? Yeah, yeah. No, it, it's it's gonna be amazing. It's gonna be amazing. But that was really what you saw there was just like a snippet of my Sonic collection video which I basically filmed in a day, and I recorded and, like, and edited and just in like a few hours, just kind of quickly slapped that something together, and I totally didn't even realize that like, once it dropped, it hit, it boomed. Like, it's almost at like 100K as far as like, views go, and that's amazing for somebody who's just starting out, and um, I owe a great deal to him, you know, and a great deal to just the Sega as a whole. Even Sega now, I'm part of a special charity organization called Team Sega, where through Twitch and through other streams, we do charity streams to raise for various funds. Like we just did one uh, for uh, for what's well, known as Mermaids UK. It's a uh, it's a transgender support group in the United Kingdom, and we raised over what twenty thousand pounds, twenty thousand pounds between all of us for that. It was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. So thrilled on board. I'm also part of the Capcom creator team, so you might see like some cool things happening with Capcom IPs and whatnot through that as well. But it's just it's been so amazing in such a short short time and just. I can't really thank everybody enough for how supportive it's all been. And like I said, for somebody who, this is my first year, like this is here at Portland, it's amazing, it's amazing. So, um, just a kind of a snapshot of a few of the things that I do on YouTube. Here we go. I'll show you a few of the things that I got working on. Here we go. So, here we go. All right, so 
This is what's actually coming up next on my channel. Um, one of the, the series that I'd like to do is called Level 10. Where um, we, we normally do like say your top 10s. Like you know a lot of YouTubers and whatnot, they like to do their top 10s, right? Just because, you know, they're fun, they're fun and they're good to do. And then sometimes you have ones that really like pique your curiosity, right? So what's coming out that's pretty soon that I'm really excited for, it's right before Sonic Frontiers, but I'm actually very, very excited for is the release of the Sega Genesis Mini 2. And, like, and I love the Sega Genesis Mini. It was a wonderful little mini console. I can't wait for this new one. So when we were looking at the game list, I was like, even though this game list is fire, there's still some that I think are kind of missing, right? And that's really where it comes down to. And so I did one before when Sega released the Sega Classics Collection, and people seem to like that, so I was like, okay. But this is just one out of three Genesis Mini 2 uh, videos that I've got coming in the pipeline. Another one, <laughs> this one's actually a lot of fun because it's like we all have our moments that like we find these games that we love and that we grew up with as a child, but there are moments in there that you're just like, wow, oh, this part sucks. It's just like even, though, like, even though you still love the game, but so 10 great moments in games that suck. See, like things that I like to put into those sort of perspectives, it's like, but do it in reverse. Instead of like bad moments in great games, how about great moments in bad games? So it's like, so we do it in, in reverse. So. And here's another one where the TurboGrafx-16 Mini, another system that I love to death. And um, this one I'm actually going to be printing out, pulling out of the table too because I know the Mini's been out for a while, but this is one that I love the TurboGrafx-2. Very underrated system. Like, very, very underrated system. But, yeah. And this one. So, this is one of the new series I've actually got in the pipeline. This is called From Gutter to Throne. And what it is, is it's a ranking series where I basically I'm going to take everything from one facet. It's like say, in this case, again, going back to Sega, because uh, the 32X, I have a real love-hate relationship with the 32X, because like, I got it, and unfortunately, because of how quickly it failed and whatnot, it kind of burned the relationship between my parents and Sega. They honestly never wanted to buy me another Sega product ever again. <laughs> but, uh, but I still love, unabashedly love the 32X. Like, I think it's still a great system, so, uh, yeah, we're doing it. We're taking every 32X game, and we're going to rank them from gutter to drama, but uh, keep this in your mind for just a few moments. So another series I like to do is uh, called Console Consultation. I don't know if you saw in that, um, in that preview video that arcade one-up uh, cabinet that I had, and the, uh, the Retro Freak. I normally like to take newer retro-style products and do a full-on deep dive and review into them, like do an unboxing, talk about what's in there, talk about the performance, talk about the feel, talk about the marketing, talk about all of that. And um, I actually managed to get my hands on an Atari VCS. And to be completely honest, I have no idea what I'm doing with it. <laughs> so I figured that would actually be a really unique take because when I look at all the other reviews and one of that basically do like a full-on dive on it, nobody really looked at it from like a noob's perspective. So I was like, you know what, that might be fun. Like, that might be fun, but that's part of one of my other series, uh, console consultations. I also did one on the Atari 1UP Golden Axe cabinet, which is actually really cool. Another one in the pipeline, this I'm going to premiere in November. Uh, this is actually called Mascot Mania. One of my favorite genres of games is mascot platformers. Of course, Sonic, right? <laughs> but yeah, Sonic, Mario, Crash Bandicoot, Planoa, like all those big, all those big, big names, right? So. What do they mean to me and what do they mean to you? So what Mascot Mania is, is basically I'm going to focus on one character and then take a look at what the character means to me and a little bit of its history, why they're close and fondness to my heart. Now, those of y'all who don't know who that is, who that smug dude is, that's uh, Awesome Possum. You don't know who Awesome Possum is? <laughs> yep, Kicks Doctor Machine knows, but I'm awesome! Yep, that's, that's Awesome Possum. So, um, and what it is, I'll take... If, if a game that has more than one game, I will take, pick one game that means the most to me and do a quick review and then synopsize over the whole mascot's history. So, Awesome Possum only has one game, so that makes this one a little bit easier. But on this one, I'm very excited because I actually have quite a few special guests that are actually going to be showing up in this video. So, very happy about that. But that one is going to start in November. From Gutter to Throne is actually going to start at the end of the month. And going back to console consultation, so um, who here has Nintendo Switch Online? All right, now how many of you have the expansion pack? Okay, so you've got a couple of y'all that have the expansion pack. So um, again, this was something that I, I had to dig into because who better? Because like for Genesis, and when they announced that Genesis stuff was coming to Switch Online, I got excited. 
Especially like if you look at the games that are on there, pretty, pretty solid game lineup. But what about that controller? What about that $50 controller that is really, really hard to get like in certain circumstances, right? So do one better, review the controller, but also take a look at all the games that are currently released and take a look at that as well. So that way, I want to help anybody like if they're debating whether or not, oh, you know, should I go after this? Should I subscribe? Should I sign up? This is basically to be a one-stop shop for you on that. And I also have one plan for the Nintendo 64 controller as well. I just don't have a thumbnail for it, but uh, I do have that as well. And then going back to Gutter the Throne, this is episode number two. This is one that's very near and dear to my heart because like with Sega, one of my favorite publishing companies is Renovation Products. You know, it just makes some of the most wild and wacky games that you would never ever expect on this system. And this one's gonna be a lot of fun too. So that's episode two. I'll let you, um, I'll let y'all decide what this one's about. Uh -oh. <laughs> We're coming back to Sonic, but because uh, everybody asks me, like, what is the worst Sonic game ever made? Uh -oh. And I'm just like, I figure I have a good reason to answer that question with, uh, with the game that you see there. So um, <laughs> we'll have to wait for that one. <laughs> <laughs> and it's uh, actually it for the thumbnails that I have. So those are just basically a sneak peek of what I've actually got in the pipeline when it comes to YouTube. So that being said, I did promise you all that you would get a sneak peek of something new that's coming, so. And I know a couple of you in the audience that I know for sure are gonna be excited about which one you're gonna to get to see a sneak peek, so which video is it? Which one is it? Which one will you see the sneak peek before? It's this one. So yeah, I'm gonna take a little tiny bit of the uh, the 32X, where so you get a, a good little snapshot of what the From Gutter Throne series is like. And uh, yeah, let's go ahead and hit that. All right, let's do it. Oops, I'm not getting audio. Hang on, actually, you know, it's on me. Give me one second. Oh, nope, it should be. VLC, either VLC. Yeah, the VLC might be needed. Oh, is it? Oh, it is. You're right, you're right. Yeah, okay, got it. Got it. The company's biggest missteps in the almighty console wars of the 1990s. Yeah, Many people see the Sega 32X as one of the company's biggest missteps in the almighty console wars of the 1990s. I can see why Sega wanted to bridge the gap between the previous generation of the Mega Drive and the future, i.e. the Sega Saturn. In the West, the Genesis still had plenty of life left, and while I feel that the 32X was a conscious effort, in the end they really should have just cooled their jets a bit and let the Saturn run its course. Alas, the 32X wasn't long for this world. It wouldn't even be the first attempt to Sega trying to jump the gun on its competition, and it most definitely wouldn't be their worst. But it really should be no surprise to you that I'm a huge fan of the 32X. I love the system dearly, dearly. In fact, I remember that Christmas morning, the year that the 32X was launched, when my parents got me the 32X, and they got me these three games. They got me Virtual Racing Deluxe, Doom, and Cosmic Carnage. Well, two out of three ain't bad, right? The system is mostly seen as a bomb, but the quality of the small game library is what routinely comes up for debate among the retro community. Some say that the 32X game library is filled with gems, while some say it's one of the worst in history. So that's the subject of today's video, which is the debut of my new ranking series that I call From Gutter to Throne. And today we're diving into the library of the Sega 32X to see which classic game sits at the top, which travesty is in the ditch, and all the games in between. Of course, a few conditions. First, this list will consist of only the Sega 32X cartridge library. No Sega CD 32X games. I want to keep the list fair, and since they're all just enhanced ports of Sega CD FNV games, I may save those for a future list. And one 32X cartridge game will be omitted from this list, and that is Single Kushi 4, the Japanese exclusive port of Koei's Romance of the Three Kingdoms 4. I've never played any of the games in this series, and since it's very Japanese language heavy, I can't review it. So if you have played it, consider Single Kushi 4 ranked where you believe it should be. That being said, strap yourself in, get yourself your favorite beverages and snacks, as we're going to take a look at what takes home the gold and what sits in the mold, as we take a look at every Sega 32X game and rank them from gutter to throne. I'm G, and welcome to the next level. Lying in the gutter at number 33, it's Motocross Championship from Sega. Extreme sports were all the rage in the 90s, so it makes sense that Sega would want an extreme sports game for their 32X lineup. So we got Motocross Championship, and the only thing extreme about this game is how extremely awful it is. 
The game is ferociously ugly to look at, with muddled textures, blurry or non-existent backgrounds, and overly pixelated characters. I get that the 32X struggles with textured polygons, but this game is just gross to look at. I mean, take a look at Road Rash 3 on the Genesis, a game that came out the same year as the 32X. Half the bits, but twice as appealing to the eye. The audio is pretty terrible, too. Very shrill, harsh Western Genesis music that obviously isn't using the 32X's power at all. And be prepared to hear the clanging of your bike and your colliding opponent saying, A lot. It's so bad. Every race just consists of everyone dogpiling into each other. It's freaking stupid. Just like the AI. It's pretty non-existent. The controls aren't too bad for the bike itself, but when you try to punch or kick people, again like Road Rash, it's so delayed and in some cases won't respond at all. And why are you punching people in a motocross game anyway? And the tracks are uninspired, and because you're so close to the camera, many times you wind up jumping into a mud pool or colliding with another racer when coming down off jumps or taking sharp turns. It's a disaster. Keep in mind this is a game that SEGA published themselves. This is embarrassingly bad, especially when there are several racing games on the Genesis that look and play much better than this game. Overall, Motocross Championship is ugly and annoying, with the latter being the keyword here. Everything about this game is annoying. Unless you're going for a full 32X collection, stay away from it at all costs. Next. Number 32, BC Racers from Core Design. If you're a fan of Chuck Rock, stand up. It, it, no? Nobody? Okay. Ah, there's one. I knew we were out there. BC Racers is a kart racing game that's a spin-off of Core Design's Chuck Rock series, and the 32X version is a port of the Sega CD game of the same name. And like you'll see in many of the games that make up the lower half of this list, you'll question why they ported it to the 32X in the first place. I actually kind of like the Sega CD game. I mean, it's not mind-blowing or anything, but it has a consistent frame rate, good soundtrack, and you can attack in two directions. The 32X version is worse than the Sega CD original in nearly every way. Not only that, it's another 32X game that's just ugly to look at. You got pixelated character sprites, environments that try way too hard to be cartoony, and the frame rate is all over the place. Some stages are just a nightmare to get through, like this nighttime stage where you can barely see in front of you, or this forest stage where there's just too much going on. But what kind of frame rate is that? Yes, the controls are very slippery. There's no brake or drift button, so I wound up crashing into the signs or environment even when they're slowing down to a proper speed. This happens a lot, so you'll find yourself crashing out of races more often than you'd like. The whole game is just very mediocre. The colors are blah, the music is boring, the characters are all very uninteresting. In fact, probably the most interesting thing about this game is this random muscle-bound dude flexing during the character's select screen. Like, he's not even playable as far as I know, so why is he there? Is he a recurring character in the vast Chuck Rock universe? Someone's gotta have an answer. But yeah, BC Racers? It's not horrible by any means, but definitely not worth your time. All right, so I've actually been working on that one for quite a while, and I'm thrilled to announce that, uh, oh, whoops. I am thrilled to announce that it's actually going to be released at the end of the month. So, I'm very, very happy about that. Oh, sweet. Oh, never mind. All right. I assure you I know how to work these things. <laughs> All right, so, yeah, that's pretty much YouTube as a whole, right? And, and I'm really looking forward to the future. There's going to be a lot, a lot of good stuff that's coming to the channel. And I know that I had to take a little bit of an extended break for a while for various reasons, but um, I'm glad to be back in full force. So, that being said, what was I doing in the meantime? Well, I got bit by the Twitch bug. Like, who here watches live streaming on Twitch? Yeah, Giant, yeah, I hear you, Giant, yeah. I know we've got some data issues right now. <laughs> by the way, Twitch chat, how you doing? We're actually live on my stream right now. There you go. But well, kind to trying to anyway. Yeah, it's like data notwithstanding. But um, but yeah, so I roughly stream about four days a week on Twitch, and Sundays, Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. And I try to keep things in the same sort of variety, but also I do uh, modern stuff as well. So like Sundays, on Sundays I have theme days. So on Sundays I do RPGs or what I like to call Shining Force Sunday, where like I take on a different Shining Force game from the Sega Shining Force series and play them all the way through on Sundays. So it's kind of the longest, more episodic side to it. Or I'll do stuff like Crusader of Senti or Snatcher or something, which by the way, Snatcher is amazing. Ooh, where is that, where is that, did he leave? <laughs> yeah. your friend? Oh man, there was, a, there was an awesome Gillian cosplayer here. And I was just like, man, dang, I wanted to get a picture with him. But, oh wait, uh, okay, awesome, awesome. Um, and then uh, I do Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, or Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. Thursdays I'll normally do like retro and retro inspired stuff, or sometimes more modern games. 
And then Fridays is community night. So community nights, like I'll do on the Switch mainly. So we'll do Mario Kart, Mario Party. Uh, we used to do Bomberman R, but unfortunately it's not a thing anymore. But of course, Splatoon. Who here are Splatoon players here in this audience? Heck yeah. No, I, I love that game so much. <laughs> like I would have never imagined like how much I, that game would become huge for me. You know, that's a big thing. But, and then Tuesdays most especially, because going back to being you know, retro-focused, on Tuesdays I do viewer request night. And so when I do viewer request night, basically you request games for me to stream. So whether it be on Genesis, Super NES, or PlayStation, I'm going to expand that a lot more too. So you use your channel points. You know, when you watch streams on Twitch, you get channel points. You can use those channel points to request a game for me to stream specifically for you, which is really, really awesome. Um, so just to kind of get a little tiny bit of uh, what my Twitch channel is like, check this out. Uh, welcome in and welcome to the next level. That was one of the charity streams. <laughs> That's my wife, by the way. In a world where pizza always responds, a select few are chosen to pick the ones that are worthy of being eaten. Which ones will rise and which will fall? Coming to theaters near you as the dough rises. Rated PG-13. <laughs> Sometimes I cosplay too. Well, back in my day, we used to slay demons one on one in this annoying litany and Tanjiro Kamado kept on getting on my nerves. Oh, I wanted to slay him with a four rush. Dang, this thing's hot. It's freaking hot. That was a sponsored stream, by the way. Let's see if it's boobs. Alright, Kale says it's boobs. <laughs> Wait a minute, is it Tyrus? 
And it's gold next too. Her outfit's different. That's why. Oh, uh -oh. go team. <laughs> Alright, so what are we doing here? We're actually raising money for Team Say. We're raising money for Mermaid UK. It's an awesome organization to help transgender, uh, non binary, and uh, gender fluid youths and their families. If you type an exclamation point charity or exclamation point donate in the chat, you can help out. If we hit a thousand pounds, we'll play the air of the little mermaid off street. Boom. I mean, thank y'all. And thank y'all for being there for me and all the support that you've given me, too. And it's been great. Now, this is only the beginning. Y'all been awesome and amazing. And I hope that, you know, after this, we continue to be awesome and amazing. So, yeah, that's me. All right, so yeah, that's just a little snapshot of all the, the mayhem that happens on Twitch sometimes, and and yeah, it's just because the communities in Twitch, because many people don't really think of Twitch for being a, a hotspot for finding like retro streamers and whatnot. You'd actually be surprised. There's a lot of us out there, and this the communities have just been wonderful and amazing, and it's just it's a lot of fun. Like it's just it's a whole lot of fun getting a chance to play and finish games that. I never really got a chance to play before, and yeah, it's just been awesome. So, um, but however, I don't know if y'all noticed one little thing. I got one last clip to show y'all. Like one other thing that um, that you noticed in there when I sang that Marsupilami theme song. If you notice, it says "Raid a Game." So, one of the other things that I'm working on is I'm writing a book about the Sega Genesis, and essentially, it's uh, right now it's called "Growing Up Genesis," where it's going to be a compendium of like reviews from the United States. Gen Sega Genesis Library because I actually have all the U.S. cards, and so we get a chance to review all the games in little bite-sized chunks. But we'll also talk about childhood memories, talk about variants, talk about accessories. The 32X is going to have its own chapter, and plenty of other things. But one of the things that you can also do when I'm on stream is use your points to make me rate Genesis games, and I use every single one of them as part of the book. And so I picked one uh, special one that I actually wanted to share with y'all. So we're talking about beat 'em ups, right? <laughs> How did I not talk about Alien Storm? Remember, we were talking about like beat em ups that aside from Streets of Rage that are just amazing. How did I not talk about Alien Storm? Like, seriously. So, Alien Storm, for those of y'all that don't know, it's a beat em up. It's basically in the arcade, it's up to three players. On the Genesis, it's only two, unfortunately. But you do get three different characters to choose from. You get a, a, a male character that uses a lightning weapon, you get a female character that uses a flamethrower, and a robot that uses like a lightning whip. It's very, very cool. And the thing is, is that it's very tongue in cheek. Because you're, uh, you're basically a troop of people that run a burger stand called Alien Burgers. But then whenever, you know, they get the call to stop an alien invasion, they turn into the Alien Busters. And I never played the arcade version of Alien Storm until I got the Astro City Mini. Once I got the Astro City Mini and I played the arcade version, it actually made me respect the Genesis version even more. Because the Genesis version is such a good port. And the game is just, it's a lot of fun to play the graphics are great. The music is awesome. I love the soundtrack of Alien Storm. And the boss battles are really challenging. But Alien Storm turns you on your ear for two different things. You think it's just a standard beat em up, where you just, you know, you jump, you punch, and then you also have an energy attack that either clears the screen, or however, like the robot character, for example, when you do his uh, complete screen clearing, he explodes. Like he self destructs. And it's funny, like he self destructs, and then his, like, his head drops, and then another robot body comes and picks up the head. It's so funny. Like, the, the humor, like the tongue in cheek humor in this game, the, the personality in this game is freaking awesome. It absolutely is. It's just such a shame that Sega really went nowhere with it. If I'm not mistaken, Sega Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm not mistaken, this game is a one and done. Right? There was never a sequel or anything like that. I mean, I know it's loosely tied to Alien Syndrome, but it's not quite the same thing. Which, by the way, why did the Alien Syndrome never come out of the Genesis? That was weird. Correct. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah, so this game is a one and done. It's such a shame. Uh, the Genesis version is fantastic. Uh, the arcade version is better. But the thing is that Alien Storm, I'm so glad that since it showed up on the Genesis Classics, unfortunately it did not show up on the Genesis game, but it did show up on the Genesis Classics, so at least Sega paid a little bit of homage to it. But yeah, it's a fantastic conversion. But here's how the game turns it on its gear. This game turns it on its gear because it goes from being a standard side-scroller to a first-person-ish kind of rail shooter where you're inside like a convenience store or a car shop or something like that. You basically have just your gun. You have to shoot all the different aliens that are coming at you while collecting energy tanks. And then there are side-scrolling portions where the game turns into a shmup. Or, or shoot em up I know some people hate the term shmup. But it turns into a shoot-em-up. It's so freaking cool. I love this game. 
I, I absolutely love this game. I have only been able to beat the Genesis game once. Once. I would love to try to go back and beat this game again. But the base Which game I did. is great. The conversion is fantastic. There's just... Honestly, this, this is another must-play. This is an absolute must-play. Y'all really throwing the must-plays at me today. Because I know I haven't rated this one before. At least I'm, I'm pretty sure I haven't rated this one before. Even if I did, I don't care. I want to talk about Alien Storm again because more people need to talk about Alien Storm. I actually didn't rate it. All right, well, thank you, Ron Chung, for that. All right, so that being said, what's the G rating? I, okay, duh. Five Gs out of five. Like, seriously, this this is one of the best beat-em-ups on the system. I'm sorry. Um, it's probably my second... I can't believe I forgot about Alien Storm. It's probably my second favorite beat em up on the system. It does go ahead of Hyperstone for me. Like, seriously. And ahead of Proprium. For now, for now, the more I peel on Proprium, the more I like it. So, we'll see. We'll absolutely see about that. But yes, Ranchan, thank you once again. Like I said, to those of y'all in the chat, don't be shy. Make me rate these Genesis games, because every time y'all do this, y'all help me go towards the YouTube series and the book. And it's free. So, by all means, thank you so, so much. And uh, let's get back to the game. Yeah, so that's one of the things that you can do for me on stream. And yeah, Alien Storm's amazing, by the way. <laughs> so I definitely stand by that. It's awesome, awesome game. Uh, but yeah, so that's, that's just kind of the channels as a whole. So like I said, this YouTube, Twitch, the book, all kinds of good stuff. You can find me pretty much anywhere um, at G to the next level. I'm, I'm pretty much there. I have a Discord server too. All kinds of awesome stuff. So um, yeah, it looks like we got quite a bit of good amount of time left. So um, if anybody's got any Q&As, I've got a microphone right there. If you actually wanted to, to line up and ask any questions that you might have for me, uh, go for it. And then um, we'll actually do a little bit of trivia after that too. But yeah, anybody? Thanks so for Don't be shy, don't be shy. But anything retro or, or streaming or, or yeah, YouTube so, or anything like that? Uh, you like Sega and all that? Um, no. What is the, <laughs> what is the, what's your favorite game? And then what do you think is the best game? So two part, best game, and then what's your favorite game? So best looking, you know, what do you think is the best, but is your, not your, necessarily your favorite, you know what I'm saying? Okay, I got you. So what, what do I feel overall is the best game yeah, on yeah, the system? Well, your, then your favorite. I think actually, I would have to say, I know it's kind of a cop out, but I think I would have to say best and favorite to me are both the same. Right. It's Streets of Rage 2. I think it is. It's, it's Streets of Rage 2 because when you talk about beat em ups, because I was just talking about aliens from that video, talking about beat em ups, just to me, I think, you know, with a possible exception, Streets of Rage 4, uh, Streets of Rage 2 is just, when it comes to that generation, like to me, it is the most solidly built game on the platform. Like, it is, to me, it is close to like a near perfect game. Like, the graphics are amazing, the soundtrack is incredible. Yeah, like, like, the Yuzo Koshiro soundtrack is just can't miss. Yuzo can't miss. So did you get the new one that came out on PC? 4? Yeah, yeah, 4 is awesome. And four is awesome too, but yeah, it's just it just really comes down to that. It's like every time it's, you know when you play a game, and two things, you smile like immediately when you first start playing it, and then once you start playing it, you can't stop until you're done. That's just me. Whenever I fire up that game, I have to play it to completion, like yeah, none beaten. And I, I've beaten it pretty much on every difficulty. Like Streets of Rage Two, it's it's an amazing game. Now, um, as far as what you're saying with, for everything else. I think graphically wise, yeah, graphically wise yeah. that's a tough one. And we're talking about official releases. I'm not going to throw like homebrews or newer ones or anything like that. Official releases, probably in my opinion, the best looking game or the most graphically impressive game on the system is, no, even though it's a beautiful game, but like technically impressive, I don't know about that. For me, it's Panorama Cotton. It's probably Panorama Cotton. Like if you've ever heard of that one, it's a Mega Drive Japanese exclusive. It's a 3D on rails kind of shooter starring a witch girl. I mean, a series that I love dearly. Like I love the Cotton series to death. In fact, the music that you've heard in that Twitch reel, that's from Cotton Fantasy. That's from the new game. And, but it's all in 3D, no special chips, no special things required. You don't need the 32X. And that game is like 10 times more graphically impressive than anything on the 32X. That's the crazy thing about that. No extra hardware needed, and it, it's an amazing game. It's just such a shame it never actually came out in America until the Nintendo Switch. So it is on the Nintendo Switch, so you actually can play it now, like if you want. But yeah, graphically, I think so. Um, best soundtrack, Streets Rage 2, though. That's still there. Maybe Sonic 3 right behind, the original Sonic 3 soundtrack. Maybe that behind there. <laughs> All right, what's up? Well, given that you've been around all the other consoles, where do you think Sega went wrong? Because I kept thinking about my childhood, 
And Nintendo did not release their 16-bit system until the 90s. I think Genesis was a couple of years before that. Correct. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And they could have really cornered the market, but and I and I remember when the Saturn came out, the Dreamcast. Then I don't know how many years after that, but it just it seems like there is a lot of promise, and then somehow Sega just falls on its face. And I know, having been around the arcades, that there are a lot of Sega titles. Is it more like? Sega didn't know what their niche really was, or was it just a combination of a multitude of factors that you just can't put your finger on? Well, I believe it's a, it's a combination of multiple things. Um, I guess I'll start off with, the, I'll say three things, really. Uh, one, I hate to say it, the 32X. I hate to say it. Like, as much as I, and I talk about it in the video, too. Like, I love the 32X, but to me, it was an unnecessary stopgap that they spent a lot of money on resources, a lot of money on marketing. The Japanese market did not get into it at all. They, it got it late, actually. So they got it, yeah, they got it after the Saturn, which they were like really excited for. Reason number two, the Sega Saturn. Not really going full hard into that, and I guess sort of a, a two-parter of that is the disagreements between, and again, this is, this is just what I feel, the disagreements between Sega of America and Sega of Japan. That's probably the two things. They could never ever see eye to eye on really what's the proper path. If they had just stayed the course with the Sega Saturn and not tried to jump the gun with it, I don't think it would have beat the PlayStation, but I think it would have actually kept on for a lot longer, and I think Sega would have actually had a lot better hold into the market. So when they would finally release the Dreamcast later on, which Dreamcast is an amazing system, but it's just unfortunate that it was too little too late. And then Sony did it once again, like afterwards. And, and Sega was always, and this is kind of my third point, is that Sega was always the innovator, but they always seemed to kind of fail to really push that innovator. Like, after the Master System, because you know, the Master System came after the NES. Like, well, technically in Japan, they came out on the same day. But um, after that, they were always kind of the first. Like, the Genesis was the first in 16-bit. The Saturn was the first in the 32-bit. The Dreamcast was the first of the sixth generation. Like, all that was the first, so. There's something to be said about being the pioneer, but you have to find a way to capitalize on that so that way your competition doesn't overtake you. And Sega always seemed to kind of struggle with that. Because even with the Genesis, like they were able to survive through brilliant marketing, top tier games, really finding your market and going go after it. But they seemed to struggle with that afterwards. So I think they could just could not ever recover from the Saturn. And that was just really what it was, so. It was like that for me in the game gear. Like when, when the Game Boy came out, and, and I just remember the days that the marketing was just more cutthroat. Yeah. It was, it was funny and just to the point that they would just compare and contrast each other. Exactly, exactly. That's why my second point is probably the most important thing. Like if Sega of Japan and Sega of America got along and were on the same page, they probably would have lasted a lot longer. Okay, anybody else? Come on, come on up, man. I know you got a question for me. <laughs> My question to you is, um, my, yeah, my question would be, where do you think the popularity of retro gaming is right now, and do we ever think that it will be waning, like maybe the next ten years? Now, I, like I said, as a nostalgia, like I said, as a person who loves nostalgia and loves retro games as well, as I hope the popularity doesn't wane down. But as I see, like, as more and more newer consoles come out, it seems like. Like, like I said, uh, consoles like the Nintendo Switch are putting in, um, like I said, more older games into their system under subscription and stuff like that. So like I said, wh where do you think it will like be in the next 10 years? Ooh, good question. So where do I think retro gaming will be in the next 10 years? I, I think there's always going to be a, a place for retro gaming. I think it always will be. It's just that what I've normally seen is that as the generations change, you know, as we all start aging, it's like we all start aging and then we have children of our own, if you have children, it's like we have children of our own and they start getting into it as well. That once that next generation starts going up, so like say right now, like the more popular thing is the sixth generation, like PlayStation 2, GameCube, Xbox, um, all of those, and to an extent Dreamcast, like all of those really starts, and I think that due to these new retro compilations that are coming through and stuff like the Nintendo Switch, it's one thing I love about the Switch is that the companies have really, really taken it back, like, hey, let's bring these old games back and have them digitally available you can take with you anywhere. Like the Ninja Turtles Calabunga collection just came out. Like, it's incredible. An incredible collection. The Atari 50th anniversary one is coming out. I think there's always gonna be a place for it. I just feel that, like, over time, the older generations are probably gonna start, because, like, nobody really talks about Atari. 
right now, right? It's like nobody really talks about Atari, unfortunately. I love Atari, but it just seems like just over time, within those next couple of years, the 16-bit generation, Super Nintendo and Genesis, they're always going to have their, their really avid fans, but it's still going to gradually decline over time until we get to, like, say, the seventh generation when things start getting a little weird. But um, I think just there'll always be a place for it, but I wouldn't be shocked to see it, like, start gradually. But here's the other thing. As long as there are more people that are really... Especially with like the indie market too, because like a lot of the indie games that are actually out there are very, really retro focused. I'm playing one right now called One Shot, which is actually very, very retro focused in that style. And uh, as long as they continue to keep making those games, I feel that generation is going to still continue on because they'll look at, oh, you know what, I like this game. What is that inspired by? Contra? Ooh, what's this Contra game? Ooh. Like somebody who's played like Blazing Storm or something like that. Or like The Messenger. Like, oh yeah, I like that Messenger game. What's that face like on Ninja Gaiden? What's that? You know? I, and I think there's always going to be a good spot for that because of that market as well. So I think it'll still be around. This is kind of hard to really gauge like in that sort of a time frame. But I feel there will always be a place for retro gaming people's hearts. I also have a second question. My second question is, which console will you stop at when it comes to retro? Oh man, this question. <laughs> All right, so he asked, like, what's really the stopping point for retro? So for me, it's like everybody's going to look at it in a different way because we all grew up in different periods. We all grew up, had different upbringings and whatnot. Some people consider only like the vintage vintage as retro, like the Atari, the first and second generation. Some people only figure that out. Some people will say, oh, well, you know, it's 15 years old, so that makes the Xbox 360 retro, like that sort of thing. It's like, <laughs> It's really kind of all over the place, so it's really a tough question to answer. So, I'm gonna answer it in what I feel is how I kind of look at retro. It's like, I kind of look at retro as more of a culture than a timestamp, like really out of anything. It's more about the feel of like a classic side-scrolling platformer or something like an original Legend of Zelda. Like, the newer games that come out just don't quite have the same feel. Like, it's like I could feel something like Ocarina of Time as retro, but I don't think I could ever consider something like Breath of the Wild as retro. Like with too many modern advances and whatnot. So I kind of make things simple. And that to me, with the exception of the original Xbox, because the original Xbox kind of did it in certain ways, and I guess to an extent GameCube too. Um, if it's native display is HD, I don't consider that retro. However, if it's like an inspired game that comes out for that, that's retro inspired. Like one of my favorite games in recent memory, Xeno Crisis, wonderful game. Stardew Valley. But that Stardew Valley, another good example of that too, right? So that's more retro inspired. But yeah, that's kind of my take on it. I think I got time for one more question. Sorry. Uh, sure, come on up. Yeah. Um, so I don't, yeah, I don't know if you uh, knew this, but uh, originally when they were going to release the Saturn in the U.S., they were going to release it in, in September, but then, you know, they, then they changed their minds at, like, the last minute and they released it in May at the, you know, at the first ever mm -hmm. E3. Yep. And, uh... 2 dollars yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> you were wondering about that. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, do you think that was a really bad decision? It's a terrible decision. Just period. That, that one shot right there pretty much took the Saturn out of contention. That was, that was the sad thing about it. Even if they had stayed the course, I think they, they probably would have survived a little bit longer than they did, but between them putting out the system too early, so nobody was prepared for it. They had very little games at launch because all the other third party companies were prepared for their regular launch date. So Sega only had like, what, Virtual Fighter? Which wasn't even complete in like in a few other games. Like it was barely, I mean, there's a reason why they put out Virtual Fighter Remix. Like that's like the real yeah, one. Yeah. But between that and then angering many, many companies like KB Toys, they just completely threw Sega away after that. They're just like, okay, well we're not carrying your products. A big chain like that. That's like not even at the time. And not even carrying your products. So yeah, I think that that was uh, yeah, yeah, that's a bad yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, I think I talk about one quick fire. One more quick fire question. I think we got time. Anybody got a quick one? Oh. Have you played any of the unofficial uh, Dreamcast releases? Dreamcast? Actually, I haven't touched a lot of the homebrew stuff for Dreamcast. I'd love to. I think the only couple ones I played were like Ducks 1.5 and uh, Newer Voider. Those were actually pretty good, but a lot of the homebrew ones I haven't had the chance to try it. I'd love to, though. I, I'd highly recommend uh, Sturmwind. I've heard Sturmwind. I've heard that's good. That was a really I've heard that's really good. But yeah, all right. So I think that's it for me as far as time goes. So yeah, once again, uh, I'm G from G to the next level. You know, like welcome to the next level, but with a G like me. Yeah, you can find me pretty much anywhere: YouTube, Twitch, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, 
You pretty much name it and I find it. And once again, I'm thrilled and honored. Huge thank you to Portland Retro for bringing me in. And uh, yeah, I hope to see you all throughout the con. I, uh, if you'd like, I'm actually going to be doing an, an autograph session in about 15 minutes. Uh, if you'd like to come see me there and, and come hang out and chat for a little bit. Uh, but yeah, I really want to appreciate you all coming out. Thank you all so much. And as I always say, be you and be awesome. I'm G, and I'll see you on the next level. Thanks, everybody. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and to the right are the playlist of the Portland Retro 2022 and some other interesting videos. Thank you.